All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 7, Creating Republican Government, 1776 to 1790. Section 1, Common Sense, from Monarchy to an American Republic. So let's recall, in Chapter 6, we learned about the American Revolution. And the American Revolution was the process under which the 13 colonies broke away from the British Empire. And the consequence of that was the creation of a brand new country in the form of the United States of America. And so once that breakaway was successful, the question then becomes, what type of government is the United States of America going to you know, really model itself on? Now, at the time, the most popular, and by popular I don't mean uh, what people favored, but what was in fact the most uh, common, maybe is a better way of putting it, the most common form of government was monarchy. And a monarchy is a form of government in which one single king or queen essentially ruled the area, and that, uh, you know, whatever country we're talking about. And those kings and queens are typically chosen by, you know, hereditary bloodlines. You know, in order to be the king, you have to have been the son of a king or a queen to be uh, the daughter of a king or maybe some sort of extended relative. Now, there were different kinds or versions or degrees of monarchy. There were some monarchies that we call absolute. Uh, this would be a, a system in which the king or queen has all the power. This was the case in places like Spain and France. But there were also monarchs that were limited in their power. And this was actually the case in England. The English king did not have absolute rule. There was still a British parliament that could and did overrule the king uh, in many, many instances. Uh, the King of England at the time was George III, so he's King of England, and he was the king during the Revolutionary period, uh, who the colonists had more or less protested against and broken away from. Uh, the colonists had believed, believed that George III had become a tyrant, or that he was practicing tyranny, and you know, tyranny is when rulers uh, disregard the rights of their citizens, All right? So when a ruler no longer regards the rights of their citizens, not even doesn't, doesn't protect them, but, but kind of, uh, you know, encroaches upon them, uh, you know, that would be a form of tyranny. And that's essentially what the colonists believe George III in England had done. And so when this, when the war was won by the colonial side, Practically nobody was advocating for a monarchical government. You know, mostly all the founding father types could agree that monarchy was not the way to go. And the main discussion really centered around two different types of government, republicanism and democracy. And they're a little bit related to one another, but there is an important difference. A republican government or republicanism is the idea that you have elected representatives who more or less make the laws, run the government, do the things that are necessary. Democracy is more what we might call popular uh, votes or participation. Not that you elect somebody to make the laws, but in fact, the people themselves make the laws. In a purely democratic system, all of the citizens of that particular government have a say in what the laws end up being. And a democracy, if you abide by the majority of the people, essentially amounts to majority rule. So whatever most people say. And so the question is, for the United States, uh, most are going to favor this Republican style of government. But the question is, how democratic should it be? To what extent should the people have a say in their government? Or should you sort of delegate those powers over to elected representatives who could then better execute perhaps the functions of government. And so you have essentially two different groups uh, or, or maybe a range or a spectrum of different opinions on this particular matter, but we're gonna categorize them into two different groups, conservative and radical Whigs. So the term Whig was a term that was used in England at the time. It simply meant somebody who had opposed 
the king, uh, maybe more particularly, uh, you know, monarchy in general. So these are people who don't agree with the monarchical rule. They don't agree with the idea that there should be a king. Uh, the conservative Whigs are going to favor a more Republican government, less democracy. And by extension, that would also mean less anarchy because there is a belief that if you allow things to be too democratic if you let the people decide on every single matter it's going to be too hectic it's going to be too chaotic and it's ultimately going to lead to anarchy there's not enough order in the system whereas your radical wigs they favor a more democratic system right less maybe uh you know i don't know if less republicanism is is the right way of doing it but maybe sort of less order in the system. And ultimately what they want to uh, avoid is less tyranny, right? You don't want to allow for too few elected representatives because once you put a lot of the governing power in very few hands, it's very easy for those rulers then to be tyrannical with it. And so this balance between tyranny and anarchy is a really good way of understanding what a lot of these individuals like Benjamin Franklin, John Adams are going through at this time, how to create a government that on the one hand is democratic enough to avoid tyranny. You don't want too few people controlling over and disregarding the rights of everybody else, but you also don't want it to be too uh, democratic in a sense that you're going to get anarchy. So can we get something in between these two things? Now, in terms of a social philosophy, and what we mean by that by social is society, right? the way in which people are going to practice this, many of the founders also agree that there need to be some sort of sense of civic virtue. We might sort of uh, explain this as sort of a way of, uh, uh, you know, civic, generally you can associate with things like civilian or citizen, virtue, you might say something like morality. So. You know, there needs to be a certain moral code among the citizens that there's a certain set of principal values that everybody can essentially agree upon. And if a Republican or Democratic government's going to work, then there needs to be some sense of a common moral code among its citizens. The founders also believe that citizens need to be invested in the well-being of their nation. There needs to be something on the line for them to lose. And for that particular reason, many also believe that property ownership should be a qualification for voting and participating in this society. The idea is that property owners have something to lose and therefore are more invested in the country and therefore are, are willing to be more educated and participate in it in a way that maybe a property owner sh uh, or a non-property owner wouldn't. It's important to understand that at this time, the right to vote was not necessarily seen as a right, but more of a privilege and duty, right? It wasn't necessarily a right, but was more a privilege and duty of the time. Uh, there were various organizations that espouse sort of this idea of civic virtue. This is a, a primary source of one of those organizations that would uphold, you know, certain values uh, with American society. Uh, the model kind of citizen for this was George Washington, right? Model citizen who, upon victory in the American Revolutionary War, had refused or turned down the offer to become the essentially tyrant ruler dictator of the United States. And so he, in a lot of ways, was a personification of perhaps these uh, values that many of the founders believed were crucial for the survival of the country.